All right, so uh, continuing on from where we left off last time from public sector, moving on to private sector uh, tonight with our uh, special guests, Amanda, Greg, Ben, and Trish, who we all know and love from TSCU and Aspen. And maybe if I click on the right screen, things will work better. So uh, as always, I think everybody here knows, I'm Joshua. I've been in several unions, mostly ATU, but also AFA, the flight attendants, uh, briefly asked me outside of Detroit and the IWW for some years. So I think everybody here has heard this intro before. This is a four week replacement for uh, Red Square. Uh, first week we talked about what unions do. Last week we talked about private sector activists in the DSA branch. This week we're talking about public sector. And next week we'll dive into strategy. This is more formal than your average red square, more presentation, less discussion. Uh, we are focused on a single topic of labor movement, so please limit questions and comments to that, and please limit them to a minute or so, so other folks can be involved in the slightly less discussion that I mentioned. Chat will be turned off during the presentation, so I think, Subu, if you have your hand on that button, you could do that, please. Uh, it's really distracting, so apologies for that ahead of time. Uh, and also please mute yourself during the presentation and whenever you don't have the floor. If you forget something, uh, sorry, excuse me, if something isn't clear or you have a question, uh, write it down so you don't forget it and then bring it up when we open the floor because that's what that's for. So public sector labor law, we're gonna do a quick intro here. There's not as much of this of course, because we're in Texas, so it's mostly just bad news. But I thought since we were talking about uh, government workers, we'd start with a quote from everybody's favorite communist, Adam Smith. This is not the capitalist's favorite quote from Adam Smith, as you might guess, but it's a good one. I won't read it to you because I'm pretty sure everyone here can read. So public sector labor law varies widely by state uh, from good, I won't say really good, but too horrible. And we're in Texas at the bottom of the barrel. Some states have very clear recognition rules, government entities, cities, states, counties, public hospitals, utility districts, everybody, the state itself, universities have to negotiate with the union once it passes whatever the recognition uh, barrier is, which is usually not that difficult in those states. Some states even have legal strikes for public sector workers to some degree. Uh, many where bargaining is legal, uh, strikes are still not legal, which doesn't always mean they don't happen. It just means they're not legal. Uh, as a wise person once said, if you win the strike, it was legal. And that's the, bar and that's the barrier to legality. <laughs> Some states allow bargaining, but on a, with a strictly limited uh, set of topics. This is essentially what happened among other things to the, the Wisconsin workers. Uh, sorry, my dog's scratching and jingling. So I hope that's not too loud on your end. Uh, that's essentially what happened to the Wisconsin folks when they lost what had been a very friendly set of labor laws for public sector workers there to a, what they felt was a terrible set. And yet we would all die to have here. <laughs> But for them, it was a huge step down. Uh, they were greatly restricted on what they could bargain over uh, and it made their life a lot easier. I think the state quit collecting dues. Um, another step down from that though is some level of meet and confer explicitly permitted. And then at the very bottom, we have bargaining prohibited entirely, which is where Texas and many states of the South are. Uh, no entity, no city, state, county, hospital, dog catcher manager, nobody gets to bargain with the union and the union doesn't get to bargain with anybody. Contracts are prohibited. Any contracts that existed before these laws existed were banished uh, in, in, uh, retroactively. So this is what was permitted by uh, Taft-Hartley, among other things that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. There is a strange hole in the Texas law in that it doesn't permit meet and confer, 
but it also doesn't explicitly ban it. So I don't, I'm not really familiar with where Education Austin is now, but they used to be really good and quite powerful and were able to force the school board to give them quite a lot in these meet and confer meetings. Meet and confer doesn't result in a binding contract, but it can result in winning some serious gains if you're organized and powerful. And at least when I was closer to the, the folks there, they were. I get the sense maybe some steps back have been taken, but you know, at least as an option. Uh, and of course, the question of dues deduction. Some states will willingly take uh, dues out of your paycheck, some won't. I feel, and Amanda, you can correct me, I feel like that used to be permitted in Texas and now isn't. Is that right or am I off the mark? You're, you're close. It, dues deduction is still the law in Texas, but it is constantly under attack. There have been legislative challenges to dues deduction. Most legislative sessions, uh, unions have been pretty effective at killing those bills, but <laughs> it is constantly under attack. Okay, because I know when I joined, it didn't even say that. It just said, give us your bank account and we'll take money out of there. And I was like, sure, that's fine. <laughs> So uh, Texas, not only are bargaining and contracts prohibited for you know, state, county, city employees and schools, they even go so far in the law to define charter schools as public, which that might be good if it meant that the people who work there were public sector employees and do all the benefits that public sector workers have. But of course, that's not what it says. What it says is, you know, in the charter, in actual laws for charter schools, you can do whatever the hell you want to those workers, but we're gonna define your schools, even though you're clearly a private school as public sector for labor law purposes, meaning you can't organize uh, as a private school would if you were actually a private school, like a normal union. So they've managed to give them the worst of all possible worlds. Strikes are prohibited in Texas, they do kindly give us the right to quit our job in, in Texas labor law, uh, but they do also explicitly mention that you can't do it in concert with others. So I can quit and Frank can quit, but Frank and I can't quit together if we talk about it first. So <clears throat> thank you so much for these freedoms in our freedom loving state of Texas. Uh, it does say that you can prevent, present grievances individually or through a representative that does not claim the right to strike, which I feel like that clause is probably for the reason for the clause in the TSEU constitution that says, we explicitly don't have and don't want the right to strike. Uh, it's probably so that they can use that clause to at least be able to help uh, workers who are in a disciplinary situation with the state. So the question then is, how do we get from here to West Virginia, right? It's a long ways away. It's an 18 hour drive. And politically it's even further, right? Because they have the same kind of labor laws we do. Bargaining with public sector employees is prohibited. Contracts are prohibited. And yet the teachers shut the schools down statewide. They didn't win everything they wanted. They didn't win the permanent funding for their health insurance. They didn't get the extra uh, counselors and nurses that they desperately need. And in, in the state, that's possibly the worst afflicted by the opioid crisis, not to mention rampant poverty. But the government in the state was offering them one or 2%. And they said, no and they struck and they came away. First, the state said, okay, 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 we'll give you 4%. And the union leadership, which had been against the strike from the beginning said, okay, okay, we'll take it. And the members said, no. And it turned into a wildcat strike and the state buckled and said, okay, okay, here's your 5%, go back to work. Please, please go back to work, we're really scared. Okay, maybe they didn't say it quite that way, but it's pretty clear that's what was going on, right? So how do we get there from here? So we're now, uh, 
Oh, I wanted to tell a quick story actually before we go there because it wasn't exactly as impressive as the West Virginia teachers, but I want to tell another little bus driver story. In 97, I think it was 96 or 97, things were incredibly unpleasant. They were, cra they were writing people up for every little thing they could think of. Just discipline at the yin yang for, for, for no reasons at all, just going after people. And it wasn't even like they were going after, you know, their official enemies list. And people were sick of it. And we were trying to figure out, oh, what can we do? We're in the middle of a contract. We have very limited rights. And we suggested at a meeting, we being the, you know, radical types, why don't we have a picnic? And everyone sort of sat there and said, what are you talking about? I said, let's have a picnic on the last day of the semester where UT shuttle drivers. So that was an important, you know, that was a significant day in the park for the last shift of the day and have free beer and hamburgers and tell everyone in the union we're having a picnic. It's not a strike, it's a picnic. And we're gonna say in all our publications, we're not encouraging people to take off work. And we did that. I was the, uh, at the time the recording secretary, which, which meant I had, I was essentially you know, the propaganda minister for the union. And so we said that we're gonna have beer and hamburgers in the park. We're not asking people to take off work. Now we had an incredibly flexible contract in the sense that we could take off two hours before our shift for no reason. We just called up and said, I'm not working today. And that was the end of the story. So all of the activists who weren't union officers were out telling everybody, if you don't go to the picnic, you're a fucking scab. And it worked. The place was shut down. There were about half a dozen buses running, driven by supervisors, desperately trying to pretend that things were going okay. There should have been about 80 on the road. And it was just one shift. They sued us and we ended up winning in court, but that's not the important part. The important part is it scared the hell out of the company and it demonstrated to the drivers that we had the, and the mechanics that we had the power to do that. And the next, the next contract when it came around, uh, which I talked about a few, couple of weeks ago, we took them to the cleaners and that's why, because the company was scared and the members felt powerful. So it can be done here. I mean, this wasn't a public sector strike, but it was a technically illegal strike. You just have to plan accordingly and play your cards right. So with that, we're going to, uh, let's see, where's the little button that quits sharing? There it is. There we go. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, uh, our panel of four lovely contestants, uh, Ben, Amanda, Greg, and Trish. And I'm just gonna, this is, it's sort of like an interview like last time. I'm gonna try to keep both, both unions in the, in the loop here. So uh, let's start with Greg and let's talk, talk, talk about TSEU. What does it currently do? I mean, some things we know, you know, we were familiar with the endorsement and the election process and lobbying. Talk about what else TSEU does. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I've been a member for, probably a year and a half going on two years. So Amanda may have to jump in if I miss something, but, um, and you know, the past obviously year of it has been a little bit different than your normal year of, you know, it's, it's pretty limiting having to meet on zoom all the time. When I first joined, um, we had our, um, organizing committees in a building on campus with our coworkers, um, and it felt great. And we were planning to do an in-person rally um, before a Board of Regents meeting in front of the main building on campus with the tower, which, um, you know, is a, is a good feeling. And instead, we've been doing um, actions, taking action, speaking against the Board of Regents at their meetings on Zoom, which sucks a lot more. Um, so um, that's one thing we do, you know, the TSCU, it's obviously like a very 
large sprawling union. It organizes across sectors. Um, so uh, the you know what I see of the union on a day to day is um, is a pretty small sliver of what happens broadly in TSEU. Um, so I work at University of Texas at Austin. So I see um, my coworkers, comrades, union brothers and sisters in a at the UT organizing committee meetings, which happen monthly, um, and at um, at university caucus meetings, which happen every few months, and then at general body meetings, which happen less often. Um, so yeah, that's something that the, the that the union does is provide a space for us to talk about our issues together um, in or near the workplace um, and figure out collectively what we can do to improve our situation. Um, and that's something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Frank and I and a couple of others at UT talk to each other pretty much every day um, about issues that we face. Um, so that's the most important thing I think that the union does for us as members. Um, you know, obviously TSU is pretty involved in lobbying, especially right now during the legislative session. Um, and I took it more of a learning opportunity um, than anything because this is the, my first legislative session being involved. Um, so yeah, lobbying, um, providing space for workers to, to coalesce and talk about our issues. Um, my first thing I did with the union was an organizer training based on I'd ask you to wrap up, Greg, so I can give Trish some time. <laughs> sure, based on Seek as a Successful Organizer that Amanda did a great job on. Um, and we also have done like a bunch of community aid um, during the freeze and such and tabling on campus. Um, that's what I see from TSU. Trish, you want to talk about Ask Me? <laughs> Always and forever, if I can get myself unmuted. Um, so, uh, what Ask Me does, if you're a member, and probably what most members would like, um, is um, you know they will represent you in workplace disputes, um, and they might fight for an upgrade for your position. So it's kind of like you'll have a staff member. If you've got an issue with HR, they can go in and do battle with HR, um, which is really good because HR is not your friend. Um, and then um, one great thing at the city is um, a miracle has happened and city workers who are full-time regular employees are considered just cause employees as opposed to like everywhere else in Texas, um, you are an at-will employee. Um, so small miracle there. Um, huge, and it's a, a huge benefit. Um, and uh, so I think those are kind of like the main things that the union like staff will do. Um, there's other things that like the union membership will do, but we can talk about that further on. All right, thanks. Uh, ben, tell us something, tell us some about the, about the meetings. I mean, how often are they held? Do people hear about them ahead of time? I mean, is there an agenda that people know about ahead of time? Are members encouraged to speak and participate or is it mostly just reports from officers? Just give us a sense of how they run. Yeah, uh, before I get into our meetings, I just wanna uh, clear up some jargon uh, about what AFSCME me is. It's on my koozie here, uh, but <laughs> it's the American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, local 1624 here in Austin, uh, representing the city workers and the county workers. Um, and uh, I'd say about a fourth of the people, a quarter of the members to maybe a third uh, are county workers, but the majority are, are employees for the city. Uh, we do have monthly meetings. The fourth Thursday of every month we meet. It's been on Zoom for a while, um, but uh, we are, you know, have a regularly scheduled meeting. We do get an email reminder um, if you're a member of DSA and a uh, member of AFSCME, you may get a text from me or Trish to give you that extra reminder uh, that we are having a union meeting. Uh, and the minutes are generally not 
ahead you know ahead of time av available but at the beginning of our meetings they'll drop a link and let us know what the minutes were from the previous time uh we fo follow a general order each time we do cover reports from from officers from staff um you know uh folks who have been hired to to work in in the union in the local office and help us organize um but they do open the floor you know old business, new business, uh, and then anything else that uh, people want to cover. We usually have a section that covers political education, uh, one that's uh, kind of tends to cover our, uh, our events that are coming up. And uh, I encourage all union members to, to go to their local meetings. Thanks, Ben. Greg, you wanna talk about TSU's meetings? Yeah, I kind of touched upon it earlier. Like I said, we had like, so our organizing committee at UT meets monthly. Um, our uh, university caucus meets probably every few months. And then our general body meets less than that, um, which I think we want to change. Amanda and I talked about this a little bit recently, um, that getting the general body together more often is something that we want to see a lot more of um, because there is a... I might be getting ahead of us, but there is a militant minority that exists that is able to, um, you know, that often goes unseen if we don't meet often together. Um, and that's important. Um, but as far as our meetings go, yes, members definitely, the agenda is posted before the meeting um, by and large. Uh, we essentially know it, you know, going into it, what we're talking about so we can, you know, prepare you know, sometimes a couple of us will talk and say, hey, we're going to talk about this. Let's make sure that, you know, we push, you know, usually left. Um, and um, yeah, membership do definitely drive the meetings. I think um, it seems like, at least in our caucus, um, you know, which is all I really see in our, our organizing committee, members definitely drive the meetings. Um, I suspect that it may not necessarily be like that in other less involved caucuses and organizing committees. I'm not sure from what I see. Um, yeah, our members are pretty, our core members are pretty active. Great, thanks. So when we talk about democracy in a union or any organization, it's not the end of the story, but elections are critical, right? If we don't have them, or if they're not actually real elections, then you're probably missing all the other pieces. That's my timer. So talk some about the elections in the union. I mean, how often are they held for officers? Are they actively contested? Uh, are there significant differences between the candidates? Is there turnover? Do challengers have access to membership lists? Just talk about the vibrancy of the elections in the union. Um, Amanda, why don't you talk, start talking about TSEU? Yeah, um, as far as our officer elections are concerned, um, they they happen once every two-ish years, unless there's like a vacancy, in which case we'll have a special election. Um, they happen via mail ballot, and that can be a little tricky because sometimes not everybody checks their mail or we have bad addresses for people. So that's always like a part where I'm, I'm, as an organizer, I'm worried about participation and like how many people are uh, participating in our officer elections. Most of the time they aren't contested. And, but that's been changing recently. <laughs> um, we actually had a contested election for the officer position that is um, out of Houston. Our officers are, we have like a president, a secretary, a treasurer, a vice president, all that good stuff. And then we also have executive board members that are tied to geographic districts. So there are folks who represent certain parts of the state. So there was a contested election at Houston recently, and that was the first one I personally witnessed and I've been working for the union for uh, about three, four years now. Um, you know, the turnover is rare. A lot of our officers have been there for quite a long time. Um, and most of them um, are retired. It's kind of something that they decided to do once they had a little bit more time on their hands because um, it is a, a bit of a responsibility. 
Um, as far as I know, challengers do have access to like membership lists and things like that and are able to kind of whip votes and um, beyond just the election of our executive board. Um, whenever TSU holds its, um, we call it general assembly, it's when we get um, representatives from all over the union together for a big conference once every two years. Um, all of our delegates are elected from, from the union itself. So, you know, if you were thinking about being an officer, perhaps consider running to be a delegate to General Assembly, um, <laughs> because that'll get you the practice of like talking to coworkers and fellow union members about voting for you in an election. <laughs> Thanks. Ben, what's it like in an ask me? Uh, yeah, uh, we do have elections. Um, they generally are not contested from what I've seen. Um, our our list of who has won those seats is available and it's up on our website, but our membership lists, I don't believe are available. Um, even just as a rank and file member, I, I don't think that I'd be very successful in getting a list of all of our members. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know that I've even been, a, been able to nail down how many members we have. Um, it's, you know, it is something that's always in flux, but, you know, even ballpark figures would be helpful. Um, but I, I don't know that I, I've ever heard numbers. Um, Trish may, may have heard just rough figures, but um, sa same thing here. Um, the differences between uh, candidates. I, I don't know that I've ever seen anything that's really contentious. It's more of a who want who wants to fill this needed role or who wants this name in ceremony. Um, and then uh, turnover, I think I've seen a little bit, but not much. Uh, we've had the same president uh, for a while. And I'm, I'll be honest, I'm pretty happy with her as our local president. She's, you know, she's a fighter. Uh, although I'm sure we could find some things that ideologically we don't agree on, but you know, I'm willing to march side by side with her. Um, and, uh, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't challenge. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's do bring Trish in. I, I, I don't know. I mean, obviously you're severely limited legally in some senses of what you can do, but as I was saying before, there is some level of representation that's possible. Do you, are, are there, is there something that looks like a shop steward in an Ask Me, Trish? No, not that I'm aware of. And certainly there's no presentations from like a shop steward at, at like our general meetings. Um, yeah. And um, I believe we've asked about that before and they're just kind of, the staff have said like, yeah, no, we don't have that model. Um, so it might be something that we look at doing in the future, especially as like, I don't know, we have an estimated, what, 30 DSA members in AFSME now. Um, they're not all super active in either AFSME or DSA. But, um, you know, we do have a core of probably about 15 DSA AFSCME organizers that we could marshal to do something. And um, I would love to activate and pull in deeper those other, that other half of the folks who are not um, super engaged. Um, <laughs> yep, lots yeah. of projects. <laughs> yeah, always. <laughs> uh, do, do they, are there stewards in TSEU, Amanda? So I'm gonna go ahead and like jargon, jargon draft this a little bit. Um, uh, I think what the traditional labor movement considers a shop steward is like the, the point of contact for the union on the ground in a work site. So that's usually someone who is like a rank and file worker who's taking a leadership role um, at their job. Mm -hmm. uh, they may or may not be paid, uh, oh, yeah. but that's, that's like a rough definition of the term. So while we don't call them stewards, um, we do have members that we identify as leaders in their role. We usually call them activists um, or core members, um, something like that. Um, and I think with, with public sector unions, especially 
it, it might like, if you want to be that person that like is the union in your workplace, you might just have to find like a different way of saying it than steward. Like if your union doesn't have stewards, um, maybe say something like, okay, but like, I want to be involved. I want to do union stuff every day, all the time. What do you have for me that I can do that, that I can be engaged, that I can be um, that person uh, carrying the flag for the union every day. And different unions may have different programs. Like I might, cause I'm a former AFSCME member myself. You guys might want to ask about becoming a volunteer member organizers. Um, I took a training like that whenever I was in AFSCME and it, well, again, I was not a steward, but I was collecting union cards. I was having conversations about the union with my coworker. If, with my coworkers, if people had problems, they would come to me. And I was functioning for all intents and purposes as a shop steward without that being uh, a name I was explicitly given. So it might just be, sometimes it might be a jargon thing <laughs> is uh, my, my, has been my experience. Um, so yeah. And for TSU, because we don't call them explicitly stewards, they're not really elected or appointed. Um, they are identified and trained is kind of how I, how I phrase it as, as staff. Because like, that's my, my role, one part of my role as an organizer is identifying natural leaders within the workplace and getting them the tools that they need to fight for themselves and fight for their coworkers. So that's why folks like Greg and Frank got invitations to attend additional trainings and build their skills as workplace organizers. So that way we could put them in that type of role, even though we don't like say it like that. You know sure. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. All right. Uh, talk about the communications media in the union. Is there a publication, uh, a listserv? Is there a debate in it? Can members contribute? Uh, do they contribute if, if it's possible for them or is it pretty much all sort of news from uh, the center? Uh, Trish, why don't you start talking about Ask Me? Yeah, so Ask Me has pretty basic, these are not the most like technologically adept staff. Um, I don't think they have like an Instagram or anything. I've looked for Twitter for them. They don't have it. I've never um, heard of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, for our chapter. I mean, the the national asks me, of course, has a big thing going on. I'm gonna uh, just double check myself. So yeah, they're they're not super like technologically there. I don't think um, Ben can correct me if I am wrong, but um, I'm always happy to be wrong. Um, or at least mostly happy to be wrong. Um, but yeah, so there's like a semi-annual newsletter that comes out and that's like a, a paper copy and that gets mailed to your house. It's usually about elections and you know stuff that they have won at the uh, county or the city. And it is primarily written by staff. Sometimes there, there will be a guest columnist who's just a regular member. Um, or like the president, um, but yeah, it's not, it, there's not a whole lot of um, uh, like sophisticated communication. There's not a listserv. They do uh, send out email updates with like, hey, this is urgent. We need you guys to call your representatives for thing X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, Carol will occasionally, Carol is one of the lead staff people, will occasionally post on Facebook. She's been doing it pretty regularly, um, every, like once a week sometimes of, of like updates of things that they're going on, the negotiations that the union is engaging in with the city and the county. Um, so yeah, those are, those are kind of like the main formats and yeah, so they'll, they'll let us know like, oh, your premiums are going to increase for your insurance um, or not, or like we're getting a 2.5% raise for the county employees, which actually looks like it's going to happen. So that's good. Um, but yeah, those are the kinds of things that they'll let us know. So, and it's been weird, like they're not digital natives from mm -hmm. what I can tell. 
So it, the pandemic has made this hard. Uh, Greg, we'll talk about the communications in the TSCU. I think we see a lot of the same things. Um, the leadership probably not super tech savvy. I mean, I'm going to take some. Oh, oh my, my audio is messed up. Just kind of max headroom me for everybody. Well, no, no, let me see. Let me do the thing. Carry on, watch this. No. Maybe if you try muting, muting Josh. Usually you have to like close out and go back in again, Greg. Okay, is that better? Much. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, I have to like disable and then re-enable my microphone sometimes, it sucks. Um, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, so I think we see sometimes the um, some of the same things that um, that you were describing and asked me where um, our leadership is less tech inclined. Um, that's been changing a lot over the past, well, obviously over the past year with ha just having to be, um, but also because, you know, we've been pushing a little bit for that as, as members um, and that tends to work. Um, we got a Slack instance up for our university caucus, which rules. It allows us to talk to each other horizontally, which has been, um, you know, has kind of, I think, boosted our involvement a lot, a lot of our core members. Um, we're also, TSU is on the Twitter, it's on the Insta, it's on the Facebook. Um, so, and you know, they're pretty good. They definitely retweet, retweet a lot of like members who have, you know, important issues or things to say. They retreat, retweet coalition organizations, um, like underpaid at UT and other campus groups. Um, what else about communication? Yeah, there's a newsletter that goes out probably once a month. Um, a lot of like, you know, um, mobilizing for actions. Um, and we definitely he have heard a ton from um, our political folks um, during the legislative session. Um, Sarah does a really, really good job of making sure that members mobilize to stop the legislature from doing the most awful things, um, which, you know, the, the Democratic caucus didn't do a great job, but uh, we, we knew what was going on and we pushed for things pretty hard. We even um, showed up to, um, to the legislature, some of us to, uh, to, to stop some of the more heinous bills. So um, that's, that's the nuts and bolts of communication, I think. Thanks. So I think Ben had said that he wasn't really sure how many people were in the, in the local. Do you, Trish, do you have a sense of how many folks are in Ask Me here? So I only kind of know for like the city and if the city is at like 30% um, membership, mm -hmm. which um, most of that is going to come from Austin Energy. Um, and Austin Energy uh, is one of the frequent targets of the Texas legislature, partly because, you know, it is a publicly held entity, but also because it, they are aware where the union membership lies. Um, and are always trying to strategically weaken that. And you'd said there's 30 some DSAers there? Yep, there's 30 some DSA. And most of us are like, you know, library or, um, you know, working in the development section, development services division. I work in public health. Um, you know, we're not the uh, areas where you would see traditional unionization or where like Ask Me really got its start at, right. say, in the I Am The Man campaign with um, trash collectors. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of a big gap there. And um, I, you know, Ben and I have kind of like casually talked about like, how do we change that? How do we bridge that? How do we make DSA more relevant for these apps me members who have really good politics actually there are a number of folks that i'm like wow you are an impressive person 
and you have like a class analysis just like naturally <laughs> um yeah. why you know how do we get those folks in dsa that's kind of like a question like i still think we we probably look and sound like aliens to them sometimes with <laughs> so it's, oh, it's yeah. um going to be an interesting challenge. So I welcome any advice that anybody might have about like reaching out to that traditional set. I don't want to get into it now, but I have an interesting connection to the, the waste department that we should talk about another time that isn't, isn't here. So uh, Amanda, what's what about TSCU? Like local here in Austin, statewide, DSA folks? Yeah, so I can speak like specifically to the university caucus, we have about 500, 400 members at UT Austin alone. Um, we're at about 8,000 members across the state. And I will say that like we took a hit during the pandemic. We lost a lot of members to retirement and attrition, and we haven't had organizers out in the field as much as we normally have. Um, so that's been like a big, um, a big blow for us, like financially and just sure. kind of like uh, for morale, but we're, we're fixing to get back out there and we're gonna need our, our members help to do it. I will say that, um, like Greg was saying, we have different caucuses uh, of union members based on the agency that they work in. And while I think some of the attrition we saw was due to um, pandemic related retirements or people quitting, um, and there's another broader trend that we deal with a lot in Texas, and that's that the agencies that provide state services that used to be our core, um, like Health and Human Services, that uh, the food stamp offices, uh, the folks in the Texas Workforce Commission at state supported living centers, those facilities are shrinking, like they're hiring fewer workers, um, fewer workers are taking on more work, and those agencies just aren't growing the way they would normally. Um, due to hiring freezes and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but our university caucus is like the bright spot in that very <laughs> like yeah. grim picture of where our union's yeah. at right now. Unlike a lot of the other um, agencies that where we saw a lot of shrinking and membership turnover, um, our university caucus stayed pretty steady. Um, we didn't grow, we didn't <laughs> shrink and that's actually it makes us an outlier for the rest of the union. And I think because of like the broader trends in public universities growing in Texas, that's where we're gonna see more jobs added in the future um, when it comes to state workers. So for us as a union, knowing that those are the trends, we haven't done as much work as we could have in the university setting. And I think that's starting to be re-examined and we're really trying to put um, our university organizing at the front of what we do because we think that university organizing is going to be the future of our union and what's going to keep us afloat through the decades to come so that's the that's the bright spot i really looking forward to more university organizing work with <laughs> such excellent comrades like greg <laughs> so that's given us a sense of sort of where we are so i'm going to shift the direction a little bit uh, and again, as I told you with Paul last week, this isn't intended as assaults on your unions. It's just trying to get a sense now of what are potential obstacles that we have some power over in the short to medium term. You know, not state labor law. Yes, we have power over that, but it's not going to be something that DSA is going to be able to change in the next year, sadly. So this is looking at structures in our unions, where are we starting from now, given DSA's goals and these unions, which have some similar goals, but perhaps lack some of the uh, revolutionary and militancy uh, of DSA as an organization. So uh, do you think the officers or the staff will resist a push? to a more class struggle in the union, Ben? That may come down to a uh, question of who in the <laughs> in staff we're talking about. Uh, I know for a fact that we're, there's probably some that would welcome it because that would mean a more engaged and more active uh, membership of you know, the union. 
Um, and, and then there's probably some who would resist it. Um, and I, I don't exactly know exactly where it would break down, but I, I don't, I don't think quite 50, 50, um, the communication amongst, uh, just rank and file members is, I would say limited to just the people you happen to know because of your workplace and because of who you've met at, uh, functions or, or our, our meetings. Um, but I can say that in, in our meetings, those who show up, I would say that uh, a, a vast majority have m good to great politics. Uh, and there are some who have some, some politics that maybe, you know, I, I wouldn't classify as such, but a uh, lots of the people who are in the middle uh, can be moved towards, uh, you know, more change just by highlighting the the class struggle and how it uh, how these things that may not seem immediately related can affect them and their material conditions uh, making those connections i see has switched conversations completely in fact it happened at our last meeting way to go trish <laughs> greg what do you think about tseu's leadership um, I think, you know, Ben's analysis carries right over to TSCU from what I can tell. Um, like Amanda said before, a lot of our leadership are retirees um, and carry the politics that come with that demographic often. Um, but there is definitely a core of younger staff organizers um, who are socialists or and or radicals. Um, and there's death and also, like, I shouldn't discount, like, our, our socialist radical militant minority, if you will, is, um, is multi-generational. They're definitely older DSA members, including retirees, um, who are radical and want to see that from younger members and will push and, you know, will join us in the push um, for the more centrist um members and uh a change resistant leadership maybe um i don't get too much of the uh, insight into like the inner workings uh like the layers of leadership um but that's true from what i see like in our last general body meeting uh we were able to, just like ben said we uh, we were able to sort of steer the conversation by getting fired up about um about um, you know connecting our work to a broader class struggle, um, and I think that's absolutely the way forward. All right, thanks. So, from the leadership, let's shift to the actual sort of structure of the organization. You know, the constitution, bylaws, its various documents like that. Do you have a sense that the structure has built in restrictions to real class struggle? Uh, Amanda. Yeah, so when it comes to our bylaws, like TSU is pretty young for a labor union. We were founded in 1980, but our founding documents, our constitution and bylaws were based off previous iterations from other organizations. Um, and I think what we have written in our bylaws is pretty good. The trouble is that we don't always live up to the goals of that document because we aspire to be a member-driven and led organization. The reality is that we just don't always get there. Um, a lot of times it's easier for staff or they think it's easier to um, do work that members could do um, do it themselves instead of reaching out, teaching members how to grow their own union and participate in a truly democratic way. So I think it's it's a bit of um, it's a bit of both. Like our structure isn't really well known to a lot of the membership. Our bylaws are really hard to come by. Um, they're not on the internet anywhere. You have to ask for them, and it even like understanding like what is the caucus, what is the organizing committee um, kind of keeps workers 
a little atomized and we don't necessarily always have like mass meetings. We usually have like smaller committees that get together or workers in one sector that get together. And we're not doing um, those big meetings as often as I know, I would love to hold a mass meeting. You know me, I'm a socialist, I love mass meetings. Um, but it, I don't think that there exist like structural barriers. It's just like, it's like people barriers. It's like, how do you, how do you convince the people that are in charge of scheduling the meetings that something like that is needs to be put on the calendar basically. Right, it needs and, to be part of it beforehand, so, <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah, and it, um, I know for for me, I love when I get requests like that from our activists. I'm always like down to to schedule a mass meeting or to ask for things to be different. Um, but your mileage may vary with other organizers that may have slightly right. different politics. Yeah. Um, so it kind of depends on who you're working with. Yep, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, Trish, what's your sense of ask me in that regard? Yeah, so I would say the bylaws are not something that we ever really discuss. So that's going to be structurally very opaque. Um, and um, so I, I, you know, maybe that's something that's worth exploring. I think that we should probably look more at the implicit factors, like the being spread across different departments um the differences between city and county you know and just like the social media presence um i think even the younger organizers that are on staff are old school organizers you know they do things face to face which is good this is how like dsa likes to do things too but um we still have a smart internet presence and i think that our union could benefit from that I think our union could benefit from a little more debate, although it's going to be hard. You know, everyone's there are some diametrically opposing material interests within the union, right? So we have civil service APD people who are on staff who want to argue for more cops. Um, that's just one example. And then we have like trash collectors who are like, actually, we do a lot of the same things that a cop might. Um, and we're not, we don't even have air conditioning in our trucks. So, um, you know, stuff like that um, is really, really hard. So we're all fighting for the same piece of the city budget, you know, or like a bigger piece of the city budget. Um, so it's, it's going to be a weird, like, there's just a lot. The dynamics are very strange, but um, I think more open communication and trying to push staff to open these, uh, you know, more novel forms of communicating would help. Thanks. Yep. How does the union leadership, or sorry, excuse me, does the union leadership largely accept Texas's restrictions? Or have you seen the active campaign to change it? Uh, and by Texas restrictions, you know, I'm talking about all of what we talked about before with the state labor laws. Uh, Amanda. You know, for, for our local, that stuff seems pretty set in stone. I And I think that we spend a lot of our time focusing on tactics that we can use in spite of the law. Um, so that's things like lobbying, calling representative, or even things that are kind of like in a in a more gray area, like we'll, we've done on occasion informational pickets around unsafe working conditions, which, you know, not a strike, also not illegal <laughs> to, to hold signs outside one's workplace and get on the news talking about the mold growing in your building. So, you know, I think that there is a lot of room in between for collective action that can get workers a uh, transformative change in their workplace that isn't all the way to the, the nuclear option that is a strike. So, you know, we just have to get creative and we have to have member participation to use those. So I, I wish that we were more actively campaigning to change Texas labor law. Um, it's just tough with our political climate here. So I think that's 
but you know, if there was a member member interest in doing that, I'm sure we would find a way to make it happen. Ben, what about Ask Me? Have you seen active efforts to push that, or is it just at present pretty much just accepted as how is it a man to put it uh, set in stone? <laughs> I would say that our active efforts uh, tend to be uh, more about not losing ground, right? So some bad bill is coming up to push us further back. The active efforts will go towards organizing opposition, uh, contacting elected leaders, lobbying against it, uh, doing actions against, uh, you know, passage of further restrictions. Um, as far as gaining ground, gaining yardage on that, uh, I don't see too much of that. Uh, as far as active, um, uh, you know, ways to change. But I would say that there are some things that, uh, and Trish made an allusion to this uh, earlier, uh, there's things that can be done to get around some of the restrictions. Like uh, Texas has a basically rule where you can be fired for any reason uh, or no reason, as long as it's not one of the small list of federally protected classes. Right. Uh, but within AFSME, uh, you know, there's been some there's been efforts and successful efforts at the city to have, uh, you know, just cause. So they have to give you a reason and a good reason why why you're fired. And then within the county, um, there are some offices where because they respond directly to the commissioner's court or to an elected official uh, who has opted to adopt that same stance they have uh, just cause hiring and firing. Uh, but then there are other ones where that hasn't been adopted and, and you are just like everybody else in Texas, um, you know, precariously employed. The, um, uh, I'd say one thing that's a, a kind of a structural benefit is that many of the people in power, elected officials are members of AFSCME, are members of our local. Um, and that also has some challenges, right? I've heard from rank and file members who are scared to speak up during our meetings uh, or during PAC, you know, endorsement things because their boss's boss's boss is in the room in the corner and will see them raise their hand against the position that they took. But inside the room, we're all equals. And that is where an organized group of, you know, people who want to move things forward, maybe a lot faster than others, can if we organize can actually make some some difference um you know yeah that, that would be very awkward having you know your boss or some level up in the room with you at an argument at the union meeting because you might be equal in the union meeting but you're not when you go to work tomorrow <laughs> so. uh so this is a another bit of a shift but i wanted to ask amanda who is here as she pointed pointed out in sort of a, an, an odd role and that here we are talking about the rank and file strategy and Amanda's here as a staff organizer, which is, you know, not part of the traditional rank and file strategy vision, not to say that we don't appreciate good organizers, we certainly do. But I would ask Amanda, sort of, how do you see your role as a staffer in that, in that, in, in that struggle? Yeah, and I, I've i thought about this question a lot, like as a member of DSA, as a socialist and a labor organizer, like these are the questions that come up. Um, and I don't know, I, I view my role as staff, as serving the membership. Like I view the membership as as my boss, like not, not that like, like I'm gonna fight you, but that I, I exist to do what the membership asks of me. And if uh, a member comes to me and says, I have an idea for a campaign, I think we should organize around X, Y, or Z issue, or I'm having a problem at work, what should I do? It's my job to move heaven and earth to get them where they wanna be. Um, and that includes a bunch of different things. It can be anything from like helping members with grievances to uh, creating petitions and helping identify prospective union members and like chart offices and organized workplaces. But it can also be things like if members come to me and they say, hey, I wish we had a TSU Instagram or I wish we had a Slack. And 
you know, just like we workshop, like how are we gonna put pressure on the Board of Regents? I view my role as an organizer to make members aware of the internal union politics, because just like any workspace has office politics, a union has office politics. So it's it's basically the same process. So, you know, we identify who the target is, who's the decision maker that has the power to give you X, Y, or Z. Um, and then what can we do to move that person on that issue? So if if you want to see something change in the union, it can be us like having a conversation of how should you ask for that? How can you make a demand of your union in a way that will make it easier for the union to say yes than it is for the union to ignore you? And those can be somewhat like tough conversations sometimes, um, but I'm always happy to have them because I, I want our union to be strong. And if we're not doing things that our members are asking of us, like we're setting ourselves up for failure in the long term. So I view it as we strengthen our union by working together to bring our union into the future and beyond. And that can look a bunch of different ways. So I do it very collaboratively, but it's partially because of because of my ideology that I'm oriented in that way. And I'm glad to have so many comrades pushing me to ask for more uh, for our rank and file membership. Okay, we're running a little behind. So I'm gonna, uh... I wanted to squeak in one last question and I'd ask people to really keep it short if you can. What is the mentality about the union, what the union is among the membership? Does the membership see the union as the members? Does the, union, does the membership see the union as the staff? Do they see it as the officers? Uh, Greg, take a stab at TSEU. And again, um, it, very, it varies greatly is what I'll say. Um, you know, the, the People who are core members view ourselves as the union. Um, our coworkers, you know, being a normal person in tech, I, being like a, you know, a non-activist person in Texas, um, generally have a very different view of the union. Um, the same view that you know your cousin might have, or someone who's just not political. Um, the, I first heard of the union because of a guy who had a dispute with the boss and told me that he was going to call the union. I was like, well, we have a union. Um, so for him, it was like, oh, the union provides me these benefits if I have a dispute or, you know, I can go on the website and find my life insurance or whatever. Um, and so he had like a very third party view of the union, but also he talked about it um, and, at, in the workplace to me. Um, which drew me in. So um, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an extremely varied view. Um, for, you know, it, it varies along ideological lines for sure. Um, and along lines of the target who's, who's close to the core and who's a non-active member. Trish, you wanna talk about Ask Me in that regard? Yeah, you know, it varies quite a bit. Um, it, there's there's not a lot of members who live in Austin who are City of Austin employees. I don't know if it's a majority or not. Um, and then I think probably same is true for Travis County. Of course, it's a larger geographical area, but it's increasingly expensive. So um, that shapes politics. People's relationship to geography um, definitely shapes politics makes things, can make things a little more challenging. Um, and um, it changes their relationship to the union. A lot of people, if they're um, upset with the union, will we'll view it as a, a product that they purchased that they didn't like um, or didn't work out well for them. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of people who are ordinary folks who view the union as us and the staff also uh varies i i have a feeling that they're you know i've heard organizers at least a couple of them say like you are the union the membership is the union belongs to you um i don't know if all the staff feel that way but some of them do all right so we're going to wrap up this part and open it to the floor uh, I will suggest uh, 
let's see, uh, Subu or Patrick, I'm not sure who has control of the power right now, but, uh, but I'm trying to do two things at once and my brain is not able to do that. What I was trying to do was put up one last slide. And I was so just I'm sure people have their own set of questions, but a few things to think about. Maybe if you don't have questions on your mind for uh, current or previous speakers, I thought of a couple things just to spark thoughts, you know, comparisons between, you know, how what Paul talked about last week and what our organizers here from uh, public sector talked about this week, you know, the difficulties for radicals in, in liberal organizations, which unions are largely and certainly uh, all of the ones we've talked about here are liberal organizations. They might take some positions that are pushing the envelope, but they're liberal organizations, right? And also maybe as we think about, okay, we want to get to West Virginia, but we're not West Virginia. What are some ways we're similar or different than West Virginia that might make it our life easier or probably more likely harder uh, than that? So let's open it up and uh, Subu, do you want to keep a stack? Is Subu, I assume he's still here. I haven't paid attention. Yeah, I got it. Okay. <laughs> Leah? Hey, I'm curious um, what y'all, if there's anything you would change about the union you're in or have it do more of um, if you were in charge. Classic agitation question. Uh, I'll jump on it. Call on people, just, just, just take it and, and... I'll jump on it. So if I was put in charge tomorrow uh, and, and you know, pandemic over, more social events, more face-to-face -face where we can interact with people who are not our coworkers, uh, but invite people who are not members, who are just, you know, who are our coworkers and have them interact with people who are other public employees who work in maybe different offices uh, there are some real uh, tangible benefits to your work. You get to know people and kind of get a better idea of the broader, you know, place. We're all siloed into our little offices or, or divisions uh, that would open that up. But also that allows us to kind of get over some of the hurdles that I've seen where as employees, you know, we, we will start to think about, okay, how does this thing benefit me how does this what's this going to do for me and my pay or benefits where i want to kind of have a broader look at how does this help our our fellow co-workers how does this move the broader labor movement forward um, and how does this help the working class in our city in our county in our state the the you know the benefit of advocating for the lowest paid worker in my in my you know in my shop uh, under my employer employer is that that if if we help them up that also helps us up but if i'm only looking out for myself then i'm not drawing other people to to the cause um i i agree with that for sure i mean i think you know, a couple of other things I'd love to see TSEU do that I don't see a lot of. Um, one is like just thinking about the legislative session. Um, from what I've seen, I think there's an opportunity now because people are so pissed off about the terrible things that happened in this session um, is to support socialists to primary uh, bad Democrats in areas that voted for Bernie Sanders. That's something I think DSA and TSCU should be doing a lot of, and hopefully we'll be doing a lot of in the next coming months and years. Um, and that's, you know, that's all I'll say about the electoral arena. As far as um, 
as far as, you know, on the shop floor or on campus. Um, I can't wait to get back to tabling. Um, and um, same things to um, having like happy hours off campus was, you know, something that we look forward to a lot and want to see a lot more of. So coming out of COVID, I think we're going to, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. And I think, you know, I've spent the past year sort of building clarity in my own ideology and my own place in the union and, you know, kind of becoming more dedicated um, mentally and spiritually to the rank and file strategy. And I'm very excited about, you know, practicing in person more now that we're, uh, that we, we can. I think I saw Jake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think even, yeah, I think one of the, I mean, one of the discussion questions that Josh raised was what are the differences between IBEW, which we talked about last week, and uh, all the public sector unions that we're talking about now. And I think one of the major things uh, that is um not totally lacking but it is lacking like in a uh in comparison to ibw it, it's just new organizing going on i think there, there's even given the legal restraints on public sector unionism in texas um there's still the opportunity to organize a lot of non-union members who are covered by on the union into the into the union um and uh and yeah as as josh said uh towards the beginning of this event you know that uh a, a, a strike is is legal if you win it you know and and, and uh, part of what uh the teachers in west virginia and oklahoma and arizona which are all right to work states did was you know they organized wall to wall and got, uh, you know, and got like a, a majority buy-in, super majority buy-in to the to the action, and were able to to win that way, um, with varying levels of success. But it was success. Uh, so yeah, and I think I think what you know, even though as 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 Paul was. Uh, as Paul pointed out last time that, you know, there are a lot of problems with IBW, but they are um, sending, uh, you know, uh, organizers onto job sites and and recruiting new members. And there's, you know, and especially, I think the one I'm most familiar with is Education Austin, um, which we uh, don't have a representative from here tonight, but I mean, they, it's a pretty low density um in that union there's a lot of unorganized educators uh and workers in schools and the investment of resources is just not such that the the, the main priority is uh organizing new people it's more you know lobbying uh uh making donations to Democrats, which I think should almost totally be cut out, <laughs> honestly, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, that it's, that, that kind of stuff doesn't really matter if, if you're super low density and, and can't actually um, make a change, you know, in the, in the, in the working conditions um, of your, of your workplace. So yeah, new organizing, you know, I think that's, I think that's really key, the key here. <laughs> hey Amen. And I'm just going to kind of jump in and like piggyback off that a little bit. Because um, I'm really glad that Josh like started out this presentation with a discussion of like what the law is. So like thinking about my role as an organizer, there are legal restrictions on what I can say to workers or the advice that I can give them because I'm an organizer existing under the labor laws in Texas, those restrictions don't apply to rank and file members. So like my job as an organizer is to tell you what your rights are, um, 
tell you if something is illegal or could potentially have consequences if you decide to take an action. And like, that's, if I do those things, I'm doing my job. And I, I really view my members as like, we're all adults, we can all make choices. My, my job is to inform and advise and um, if workers decide to take a course of action, like that's the worker's decision, but that's not an ideology, an ideology that's shared, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I like ideologically, I support worker collective action. Like that's, that's who I am to my core, but like there are legal requirements that I have to follow for my job. And I think it's really important for especially socialist union members to understand the law and like what their organizer legally can and can't say. Um, because I may say, you know, it's illegal to go on strike in Texas, but you know, like, like, like everyone is saying, like the only illegal strike is one that you lose. Like it's not illegal if you win. And it, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tension that I have to, to bear in mind. Um, and I feel like it's just like worth saying that that tension exists <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's always tough. It's tough to be a labor organizer in Texas. It's tough to be a union member in Texas, but I think that we are at like such a historic low point in union density in Texas that we need every single person that we can get. We need socialists in unions, agitating the rank of file, organizing their workplaces, um, and offering a vision of what the labor movement could do for their fellow workers. So like, I'm just here to get y'all what y'all need. Y'all are here to decide what it is that you need um, and like lead the union in a very tangible way. I just work for y'all. <laughs> kind of how I like to say it. Um, I really love what you just said, Amanda. That's great. And like I said, I think there are some organizers on our staff for AFSME who have that philosophy. I love to go to a general meeting and just spout off um, and, you know, tell, talk about meeting people's material needs. It's like my favorite thing to do. Um, and <laughs> there, I, I know that some of the staff in the room are with me. I know that a lot of the membership is with me. I don't know that all of the member, I know that all, not all the membership is with me, but um, it's important. It's really, really important that to put these ideas out there, to put a positive socialist vision for the union, for advocacy. Um, we've had members do presentations. Um, I believe Ben did one on uh, Medicare for all and the importance of Medicare for all. It's like we're getting screwed with private insurance. It's, it's such a waste. Um, so, you know, talking to our members about this who I, you know, the working class is so atomized so even within a union, um, and as you can probably tell from our structure and ask me, it's pretty disparate and you know doesn't have all the best tools or whatever. But the best thing to do is just to get out there and keep talking and um, talking to other members and helping raise class consciousness and let and uh, apprise them of the power of collective action. You know, and that that has been stripped from the working class, like as part of the neoliberal project. And um, so, yeah, I really just I don't know. This is great. Thank you so much, Josh, for pushing putting this on. For sure. I'm glad you're able to do this because because I can't talk about asking when you and Ben can. <laughs> so, you know. So Frank said, what union and labor friendly institution should we be integrating ourselves with a la no shortcuts? Well, <laughs> my answer I can take to a that, swing at that one too. Frank. Yeah, go, go, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Um, I think um, religious establishments are really important for us to uh, be a part of. I actually got like a really nice note from my mom works at a nursing home for retri retired uh, Holy Cross brothers uh, at St. Edward's. So it's lots of like 
Uh, they're not priests, they're brothers. They're like nuns, but they're not priests. I barely understand it, but they're uh, elderly men who committed their lives to serving a religious order. And it, he sent me a nice note about the Jane McAlevey article, like the postmortem on Alabama. And he was just like, I think you would find this interesting. I know you're a labor organizer. I think that um, religious folks need to be standing in solidarity with labor. And it was like a whole article about like how faith communities had to do more to stand in solidarity with unions. And I was like, my heart, this 80 year old wrote me a note. <laughs> and I, I think that, you know, there are places where the working class is self-organized and, um, faith institutions are one of those places. So I think when we're, when we're doing our critical analysis, <laughs> we need to look where um, people are gathered together in community and um, really try to ally ourselves with those groups. So faith communities at the top of my list. Soccer clubs. Yeah, I wanna to go to some socialist soccer games anyway, so I'm, I'm down for that. I was just gonna say athletes. Yeah, that's that's where we will get like a ton of cultural buy-in is if we can start getting more like radical athletes. I would love that. I had a union buddy when I used to be a bus driver here who had season tickets to the ice bats, which I don't know if they exist anymore. They were this, you know, 17th grade professional hockey team here. And the owner owned two teams and the other was the one he cared about. So the ones here were basically a bunch of thugs on skates, but it was fun to go to, go to the, I call them shows. They're more shows than games. <laughs> yeah. And if someone just said UT, I mean, UT is really our professional team in Austin. Yeah. So. If anybody knows any football players that want to talk about how they can get paid wages because they don't get paid right now, let me know. Like if we unionize, yeah, or band members, anybody, like I want to get some some student workers compensated for their labor. Plus, like I talk about this all the time. This is my I have so many my fun side project. If we unionize UT football, we can all go to heaven knowing we made Austin a union town. Like that is that that is my like I will fully like ascend as a labor organizer if we unionize UT football. Think about like uh, I'm just gonna like fully just like go under it. The psychic damage we could deliver to conservatives in Texas if we unionize UT football, they would be so mad. Like they would hate it so much. And it's super racist that we don't pay football players. Do you know how many billions with the B they make for the university? And they get life ruining <laughs> injuries all the time. And they don't see a cent from all that money that they generate the university and for our city so uh let's get them boys paid football yeah josh just so you know ice bats do not exist but i've heard there's a chance they may come back okay uh, thanks <laughs> one thing that i i, I kind of would feel remiss if i hadn't mentioned tonight is how someone joins my union last week we heard about uh afs uh from ibw that they have an apprenticeship program and people get paid while they're learning well, for my union, asks me, it's a, you get a job with the city or the county, and then you're eligible to join, even if you're a temp worker. So that means if you're lifeguarding at the pool, if you get a job at the library, the call center at the tax office, that's where I started, uh, you can join a union. A union job can be uh, something with just basic personal skills. If you've ever waited tables or been a host or hostess in a restaurant, you can probably do lots of jobs that are required uh, in uh, just entry level positions. So um, you can join a union that way. Um, and then the other aspect I would say is that uh, there is some power held by my union locally because of you know how Austin and Travis County tends to always uh, you know go blue as they call it, go for the Democrats. Many of those races are decided in the primary and my uh, union has a PAC and that PAC's endorsement uh, has some sway, uh, has some sway at the labor council um, and uh, more socialists involved in our local would also mean uh, more say in those decisions. 
All right. Thanks, Ben. That's a bunch of good points. And having been on the Labor Council here in the past, I'll certainly testify that ask me say on who the council is going to endorse goes a long way. And not just because AFSCME has a lot of members, but also because AFSCME has a lot of members. <laughs> so, all right. Well, we're just about at time. And so I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Subu and Patrick, do you have any... Thing you want to add before we wrap it up except that we're going to meet same bat time next week for the end for the wrap up for the labor series no yeah that's pretty much it just want to thank you for doing this it's been phenomenal every step of the way all right well thanks